Hey everybody, Kyle Farley here with the AMPM Guide Service and Hooked in Travel. We've done this in video in conjunction with Angling Outfitters in Woodstock, Ontario with all their electronics experts and pro staffers. We go over everything from sonar interpretation to transducer placement and scenarios you'll come across reading your sonar. Stay tuned as it'll be packed with lots of information from beginning to advance. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe. Stay tuned. So here's the screen layout. The history goes from the right to the left side of the screen, all the information that's processed under the transducer. Stuff on the right just passed under the transducer, stuff on the left has passed some time ago. So this all depends on how fast your scroll speed is set to. The bar on the right side is the amplitude scope, or the A-scope. Every brand has it. Shows what's happening under the sonar in real time. Everything left of that is history. The cluster of return on the surface is shown in color. That can be either turbulence, a change in water density, or stirred up plankton, debris, pollen, or plant matter. This horizontal thick line is the bottom of the water column. Depth on the left of the screen is here. Here's the temperature. Temp is what the water temp the transducer is sitting in at that surface. On scroll back, after hitting the cursor on the screen, we'll show a timeline of the history graph on the top. So everything between the surface and the bottom of the graph will show a return of some type which we'll delve into it later. So your sonar sends a signal down with a ping or pulse down to the bottom and then bounces off everything to the bottom and returns back to the transducer, giving you a readout on the screen. Real-time data will show up directly in the A-scope. The transducer works like a flashlight or like an upside down cone. The deeper the water, the wider the spread. Out towards the edges of the cone, the signal weakens. For frequency of the transducer, the higher the number, the narrower the cone, the less depth penetration. Still grayed out to 200 feet of, or of water or more. The lower number, the wider the cone angle. You get the better depth penetration as well. This is used for very deep water or for searching and getting a bigger picture or driving on plane. For chirp frequencies, the transducer uses multiple frequency and cone angles for a certain range to help separate targets better. High is 150 to 200 kilohertz, mid 80 to 150, and low is 42 to 70. This range all depend on your transducer you're using. A perfect return on your screen will show the classic arch from your transducer. Left side of the arch as the fish enters the cone angle and right as it exits. If all you're getting is partial arches, a tilt adjustment may be needed on the transducer. You're not always going to see full arches anyways, so even with a properly adjusted transducer, Full arches mean the fish is usually right in the center of the cone. The arches will look like this if you're moving. The faster you travel, the less time the fish is in the cone angle, so the arches will shorten. 5 mile per hour, it shortens, 10 shorter, and 25 may just look like a little check mark, and depending on your depth of water. If setting still, depending on how long the fish is under your cone angle, it may just look like a flat line. You may also get that if the fish is moving along with the boat. So you may even see it streak up and react to your lure. Mistaking a long fish doesn't mean it's big. It just means it's under the sonar longer and getting pinged constantly. So yellow arches can mean bigger fish, smaller with the orange, red, and blue. It can mean they're smaller or towards the edge of your transducer. They may be all similar size, just spread out over the cone angle. So target species have a distinct return on the screen. The top of the return is a dark, distinct, thin black line on the top. If it's not black or if it's broken, probably not a game fish. It should be thickness to the arch with increased intensity of the return. It shouldn't be a, like a feathery line. It should have some thickness to it, height to it, some yellow, and a black line on the top. It would be real thin. So fish could be a real small or partial mark if it didn't spend a lot of time in the cone angle or just on the outside of it. It's important to note that whatever you mark, it's not how many feet down it is, it's how far the mark is from the transducer. So this depends on where the fish is in the cone angle along the horizon of the cone. A wider cone angle, the larger the possible distance between the fish and the transducer. That's why we drop baits above the fish, making sure it's above the real distance. So with all that being said, there's a limitation on what your sonar cone angle interprets. Yellow can either be in the center of the cone, closer to the cone, or the largest return, which will make it look brighter. So the length of the arch is how long the fish is under your transducer. The thickness is the best indication on the size of the fish. 
Color is a good indication as well. It's all the strength of the signal reflected back. All of this is relative to your settings. And a good idea to dial it in is using all other fish as a frame of reference to the big one you see, whether you need to increase it or decrease it. If the fish is on the edge of the sonar cone, the signal's not as strong. It gets weaker as it gets towards the edge. It's hard to tell how big fish are on the edge of the cone. On big open water, you can look for tail or partial arches. You've marked these fish on the outside of the comb. Even though you've marked the fish on the outside, he's big enough to give a solid return. So it's probably a better sized fish. Smaller fish, you may not have seen anything at all on these edges. The sonar returns on the edge of the cone are weaker and you need a better quality fish to return it. Fish won't always make the perfect arch. If you see a perfect arch, a lot of times it means the fish is sitting still and not very active. You may have return angling up or indicating a fish is swimming. You may have returns angling down indicating a fish is swimming down. Sometimes when you're fishing less than 30 feet of water, a single frequency transducer can be a clear image. The deeper the water is, the easier it is to pinpoint fish because of your wider cone angle. The main thing is of depth of the fish relative to the cone angle. So fish at 10 to 20 feet look huge. When you're observing fish at say 80 to 100 feet, they tend to look more like thin lines for arches. Will look bigger when you're shallower because that fish is closer to your sonar. The fish size of the arch on the sonar return is relative to the depth you're at. It's experience of seeing the same size fish at 20 feet, at 40 feet, and at 90 feet and comparing them at different depths. Catching these fish helps to confirm what you're seeing on your sonar or drop an underwater camera under the boat if they become difficult to hook. Right now we're going to discuss transducers and the big thing that most people don't understand well to getting proper picture for your sonar is proper angle, proper location, and the height of your transducer on the boat. It's most likely not the settings or the sensitivity giving you less than ideal picture quality, it's the transducer location. The proper location for the transducer is paramount. If you don't get the right signal in the right location, nothing else matters. You may have to move it 15 to 20 times before you get it right for the placement. If it's not put in the right spot, the settings or sensitivity aren't going to matter. This goes for all transducers, whether it's side imaging, down imaging, 2D. The transducer is easier to place and get good readings on welded hulls for aluminum boats and fiberglass boats. It's a lot more work on riveted hulls. You should be able to get a good read at more than 30 miles per hour. So dirty pitchers are losing depth at speed can be caused by a lot of things. There's cavitation or air bubbles, pockets of water coming over on the transducer. You may need to move it away from the drains, the rivet lines, chines, strakes, and as well as any motor turbulence. Having trim tabs may only leave you with one or two options to mount it. So many factors can actually play a role in this. These can also cause a dirty picture and magnify the problems. Most of the time, it's not the unit. If you haven't moved your transducer more than once, it's most likely wrong. Or if a dealer has done it, it's most likely wrong as well. He's putting on the boat as best he thinks it's the ideal location, but you must fine tune it from there. And you won't know till you have it on the water and micro adjust the location from there. You'll never get the right picture the first time. I can guarantee you that. It's best to put a one inch puck board, transducer or polycarbonate board on your transom. You're able to move your transducer around without having to drill multiple holes in your fiberglass or aluminum boats. So adjusting your transducer with micro adjustments, as we stated before, you may only need to adjust it 1 8th or 1 16th of an inch in height to get it right. So these adjustments can make a big difference. For adjustments, you have the angle of the transducer tilted back to front, the height of the transducer up and down, and leveling your transducer side to side relative to the boat. So you need to get the transducer flat and parallel to the surface of the water for the speed you're running at, at when you're using it, not the hull of the boat when it's on the trailer. You need to make these adjustments with the boat in the water while you're using it. You may need to angle the transducer up a bit to get a proper reading. Make sure it's not pushing a lot of water creating turbulence or air pockets or bubbles. Rough water or wide open throttle are going to change the angle of the boat as it rides as well and your transducer reading. So a common problem we see is losing depth at speed. Most of the time your transducer will be set too low into the water or set in line with the hull of the boat. So your transducer pushes water and creates turbulence. You just want them to skim the water. Usually it's one eighth below the bottom of the hull you set, as it states in most of your manuals. Every boat is gonna be a little different. Certain hulls like the Lund IPS2 or the Lumacraft competitors, the transducer should be one inch below the pad because of the turbulence and the lift the boats have. 
So in the future, there's gonna be a leveling your transducer video, and I'll have this in the link in the video when it's completed. So a quick point to get across, it's super important, and not to mention to getting a clean picture for your sonar, is that wiring of your sonar unit. You need to have direct to your battery for clean power, and having enough battery to pull across how many units you're using at the same time. You're not able to use 16 gauge anymore. So most pros and installs that are done properly run 10 gauge two strand marine grade wire. There's no guesswork and it's done right the first time. Better to have too thick than too thin. Then you know it's not a wiring problem. So use proper heat shrink marine connectors crimped properly. The more connections you have, the bigger the power drop you'll see on your screen reading. The bigger screens need more power and bigger batteries, especially if you're running big screens, multiple units, using it as starting and running all the accessories across your panel, like the bilge and the live well. You can run up to four leads per terminal. After that, they start to arc. If more than four leads, get a block so you can put the end gauge wires to them, and then so you can run up for more than four leads for power. So another quick tip we have to mention here, make sure units up to date. Algorithms change, features get added, bugs get removed, and sonar angles change. For transducers, so without delving too far into the science of the transducer, no matter which brand you're going with, the most common frequency transducers for fresh water and shallow water are going to be your 83 to 200 transducers, or in around those kilohertz. So the 50 to 200 kilohertz combo transducers are generally used for salt water and deeper water. Once you start branching off from transducers around those frequency, you're starting to get to more expensive and specialized transducers like the Airmars. Some transducers, like the side imaging, the down imaging, and the 2D and the combo ones, all have usually these frequencies built in. So generally speaking, these frequency degree angles change with new updates because they all have frequency ranges, but this is just a generalization for the degree for these cone angles. Uh, refer to your reference manual or your manufacturer for get to get precise angle. Your 50 kilohertz transducers are usually around a 29 degree cone angle. A 200 kilohertz transducer usually has a 12 degree, and these are both settings usually for the salt water, like the HST DFSBL. So when you branch into the freshwater side of things, your 83 kilohertz usually is generally a 52 degree, and then the 200 kilohertz is a 22 degree cone angle, like uh, for example the Lorenz HST WSBL. Now Certain cone angles are going to vary between manufacturers. Each brand is going to have its own frequency range for chirp, single broad brand frequency, and cone angle, and how it processes it for each transducer type. The other big thing is understand the properties of using each one properly for your use, whether it's in salt water, fresh water, shallow, or deep. Each company will have its own transducer that they sell in their units with each type for each market. Consult your nearest dealer for what you're running and what area and what water type. As we get further into the sonar interpretation, we need to go over settings on your units. This plays a vital role in how your information is read, displayed, and interpreted. Having the proper settings will set you up for better on the water performance. Remember, you'll have to tweak your settings, even slightly going to each different area type, even within the same lake. You most likely tweak them even more with each new water body. So first off, we go to the transducer. Choose the right transducer in your installation. So channel one, which is a blue port, is your 2D transducer. Channel two, which is black, for your side imaging, down imaging, 2D, or your all-in-one type of transducer. And then for your channel one, you like your traditional one, will it be an HST WSBL, for as an example, like the 83200. And then an AI1 3-in-1 transducer would be going to the black port. So transducer installation, go to sonar menu, installation, and channel you want the unit to read and install. Make sure you tell the unit which transducer it's using. Usually this is always in the sonar installation menus. Some of them, you have to tell them what transducer you want to use. Nowadays, some do it automatically now with a little chip that's inside that unit. There should be a little silver tag on your plug end telling you which model number your transducer is. So we're into palettes. Depending on the palette chosen, the strongest color is the color of the bottom, as the bottom has the strongest return. This gives you a comparison to legend for your returns when you're comparing bottom hardness and fish returns. The more of the stronger return color you have in your arch, the bigger the fish. The color palette will read green to yellow to orange to red to blue to white, with white being nothing to return. So palette number one, yellow is the strongest return, then orange, red, blue, then white. 
As a result, a yellow return on the bottom identifies hard bottom, making it easier for the user to identify different bottom hardnesses and transitions. So number two, 10 and 14 are your dark backgrounds. And we'll delve into this later when you might use these. And number 13 is the same one as number one, but with bottom coloring. Does not show bottom hardness quite as well. The lighter the brown, the harder the bottom for like a brighter return. Fish and anything else as different colors. It helps to identify a fish close to the bottom with some separation. Sometimes it can show unreliable results in certain cases as it attempts to use software to interpret the bottom. In some cases, the human brain can do a better job. Most of the time, software is pretty good at this job. With frequency, 200 kilohertz provides more detail, usually a 22 degree cone in fresh and a 12 degree cone in salt water transducers. It doesn't reach as far. The coverage is usually about one third the depth and 83 kilohertz frequency, the coverage is usually about the same as the depth. You get a little bit less detail, but greater depth penetration. So cone angles are relative to the transducer, the frequency and brand used. So it might be a certain frequency and cone angle for a Lorentz, it might be different for Hummingbird and Garmin. So here we go into Chirp. Chirp delivers high resolution views by continuously sweeping through a range of frequencies, typically 20 to 51 for low, 85 to 155 kilohertz for medium, and 140 to 250 kilohertz for high which creates a more complete picture of the bottom and objects in the water column. So high chirp is a bit better in dense cover, provides more detail. So our medium chirp, better in dense cover, uh, though you'll see a little less detail, and low chirp, lower frequency for higher power for deeper water fishing. So the concept of chirp that sweeps helps the, with resolution. The increase in pulse length, stronger return, through the range of frequencies without sacrificing the resolution. Remember though, a wider cone angle averages out what's inside the cone. Things can disappear in the cone with a wide swath, like on a drop off or fish close to the bottom. It's good for showing fish in the water column. A lot less useful when for looking for fish or structure close to the bottom. A narrower cone angle, you might miss fish past the outside edge of the cone angle. For less than 300 feet, a 200 kilohertz and or high chirp is usually a good starting point. When a single frequency tends to be more useful is when looking at structure or bottom composition. Not as much confusion when the unit is processing data. And when it comes to seeing fish, chirp is usually the best option. The options available on your frequency will be set depending on what transducer supports for your specific unit. All right, for sensitivity, some people have their sensitivity way too high thinking small fish are actually way bigger than they are. Sometimes not enough, so fish on the outside of the cone angle don't show up at all, so you'll never see them. Auto sensitivity nowadays are pretty good, so it'll leave it on that, and it'll change on the depending on the depth and the clutter, will give you a more accurate signal strength and have the image look the same. You could bump it up or down, plus two or three, to see a bit more information on the screen, making sure you're seeing fish on the outside edge. It'll come naturally as you go from different areas, water types, and techniques. The adjustment will be set according to your conditions and your preference. So it's all about how you start to learn from how different sizes of fish look at different sensitivity levels for your unit and the transducer type you have. So we go into the color line. This setting changes how much color is used on your returns for your sonar. We have it set at around 76%, auto setting and zero depending on your unit. Adjust it so you're seeing a good baseline of small, medium, and big fish returns. You want to have it set midway so you're not seeing all big fish like in yellow or all small fish in blue. Color line helps differentiate softer targets from harder ones, which can help separate fish and important structures on or near the bottom. You need to have color set to determine bottom hardness and to estimate the size of fish properly. So we're going on to noise rejection. We either want this off or on low. As you turn this up, you'll lose returns that are important in identifying fish and structure. You'll see more fish with it off. This has an effect on everything you see on your screen. It simply redraws over top of your image and paints over it. It doesn't really know what's supposed to be there and what's not, so you lose pertinent information. You're better off trying to eliminate the cause of noise in the first place. Instances where you might use it, it would be heavy boat traffic, which causes a lot of debris in the water. Lots of debris from current or really thick plankton layers. Usually low to medium to you see it, but for 99% of your applications, I highly recommend you have it set to off. 
So we go into surface clarity. Off or low, best to dis disregard it. It's gonna eliminate information you wanna see as bait or fish that's close to the surface. Has an only an effect on the upper 30% of your screen and it's basically identical to noise rejection. So as far as noise goes in a boat, it can come from a trolling motor, it can come from crosstalk with two frequencies close together. The fronts pick up signal from the back of the boat. It gets confused on which is the exact depth. So reducing your ping speed can actually help with this. So most of the times with noise, it's better to find the cause of your noise and eliminate it than try to boost up your noise filter. So scroll speed, normal to times three. Normal setting for matching your display speeds to having normal arches. You may want to bump up the scroll speed to display more information in a quicker time period. Depending on your technique, say you're vertically jigging, you can get it more in real time and a quicker draw just when you're fishing underneath the boat. But A scope is great for this as this will give you a real time. But remember, this will elongate your arches as you speed up the scroll speed. It's better when ice fishing or still fishing on the boat and jigging underneath it. With a moving boat, it's best to match the boat speed to get the proper returns drawn on the screen. Normal is a good place to start. Too fast, it can be stretched out. Too slow, it can be compressed. This is a misunderstood setting and can result in too much clutter and smear that clutter, making big fish bigger than they are and other clutter can blot out information. Everything is all relative to boat speed and scroll speed when moving. It's about showing information on the screen correctly for viewing and target separation. Having a fast scroll speed is better for on plane when you're marking fish, but we'll get that into that further in the video. So ping speed, we set this to max. You leave it here on most of the time unless you have crosstalk between two different units, like on the bow of the trolling motor, or in depth where there's vertical lines showing interference. Ice fishing, you may encounter this as well. Um, most units nowadays are pretty good at eliminating this interference. Fish ID, we always have this off. Inaccurate and clutters the screen. You'll mark weeds, branches, rocks, and fish. Just please turn this off. And please turn off the beeps for it too as well. Uh, so modes. Some fishing modes will remember the last setting you used on that mode and saves them for you. It allows for easy transitions between the modes. It's noted by like a pencil mark on this button. This way you can change the fishing modes without losing your settings. Shallow water less than 60 feet. Fresh water is in lakes in 60 to 400 feet of water. Clear water for the Great Lakes and deep water for lakes up to 400 feet, etc. And salt is for salt, etc. The other one may be using is slow trolling. Each mode also changes the way your unit processes the signal and its algorithm. So the mode affects the ping itself, the power used, and how it searches for bottom and processes the return data. You may lose bottom when using shallow water mode in depths greater than 60 feet and on plane. So using the appropriate mode for your appropriate depth is crucial just because of the way the unit processes all this data. So for range, we said it's auto. Adjust the power used, the pulse length, and the depth used for bottom lock. It keeps the right settings for you as you change your depth. You're going to leave this on most of the time. So the other time you might not use it is manual mode, which takes the auto mode off the range. So it takes off this green tab on auto or menu advanced manual mode. This may be helpful for when you're trolling and only care to watch say 20 to 50 feet over top of 200 feet of water. So this limits the pulse length to the range you want and only shows uh, within that range. Shows as much better resolution too at that shorter ping length. Gives more pixel data for the area you want. Also useful for use in deep water where the transducer used is not designed for deeper depths. Instead of it constantly changing algorithms and power to search for the depth, you can point it to the right depth that you want. You, sometimes you'll lose your digital depth when it loses the auto range. Uh, here you might have to go and actually into manual mode. So like a big school of bait fish that's thick can assume it's the depth and you'll lose your digital depth. Uh, same with really thick weeds or say you have a lot of prop turbulence going underneath the transducer. In these select circumstances, changing to manual is needed. So custom allows you to set an upper and lower depth limit where you're looking for fish. It's handy for pelagic species or any fish in the mid column. It no longer looks at other aspects of the column. It looks mainly at the area we're focused into, which allows better resolution for that area. A scope, we keep it on. Instant return in real time, and it's on the right side of the screen, like I said before. Sonar, a split. So zoom splits the 2D image with a magnified view on the left side. 
The default zoom level is set to two times. You can set it up to eight times zoom using the plus and minus keys or the zoom button. So bottom lock, it splits the 2D sonar. The range scale on the left is measured from the bottom upwards and is dependent on the 2D range scale. This is helpful when identifying structure and fish close to the bottom. So flasher, you're not gonna use it in open water and most likely not on ice either nowadays with uh, a scope and history graph providing much more information as you're ice fishing. So your down scan overlay, not needed. It's not the best anymore and we have fish reveal nowadays and it uh, adds too much to the image. Uh, stop sonar, shuts the down the sonar pinging. Hand if you want to stop the one transducer while the other one is on, uh, which is causing interference. You may only need to use one at a time. Also, people like to shut it off if they feel the pinging may be spooking some wary fish. So for bottom hardness, there's different ways to check for your bottom hardness. You can increase your depth two to four times on the depth to show a second bottom. Typically, you're using a pallet like number one. You're typically looking for harder bottom in a softer bottom areas. So the thicker and brighter the return on the bottom layer is usually indicating a denser bottom, which is usually a yellow on the return. So on pallet 13, it will show a lighter brown indicating a brighter return. So that's the harder the bottom. So for pallet number one, we'll go back to, if the second bottom is further, away and less of a return than the first bottom, it usually means a softer mud or sand type bottom. And if it's closer and within an inch and thicker, stronger return usually means it's harder bottom of rock, boulders, shale, or gravel. So when looking for a second bottom, you typically want a fixed frequency and a narrow one like 200 kilohertz. Having the sensitivity set properly will help differentiate this bottom. Too much sensitivity and color line will make everything appear hard and too little will make everything appear soft. So bait is usually seen as a thick cloud. A dense school can return solid if it's not really penetrating through. It can be a small bait bunched close together and seen as a solid mass. The small individual returns get combined together as one or your scroll speeds too fast. This can get confusing if these bait balls are close to the bottom. Uh, they also can be seen as like a tree or weeds. To complicate it further, bait can be in trees or weeds. When we try to dissect this, when the top edge of the return is usually smooth and the bottom of it on this return is usually broken. So it's usually bait. In these situations, this is where those better transducers come in handy. A 1000 or 3000 watt airmar will show individual Chinook, Coho, and the bait fish. So when we see bait and they're spread out over an expanse, there's probably not any predator fish in the area and it's not being attacked. When it's attacked, they bunch up, go close to the bottom or surface or against the vertical structure. That huge expanse of loose bait is a good chance that they're not in an area of feeding fish. If you see bait fish close together, pay attention to those arches. Closer the arches to, are to the bait, the more active they tend to be feeding. So weeds and trees are return as like broken or jagged on top. Weeds will show sometimes as tall vertical columns depending on the stage of the weed growth and the depth. Uh, rocks and stumps. Usually it bumps on the bottom and they're usually stumps or rocks connected to the bottom. They have no target separation. They're a hard piece of structure. Usually returns as a rough top edge. Separating fish from the bottom can be difficult. The newer transducers and fish finders are getting better at separation between the bottom and the fish, but it can be easier switching to a brown colored bottom. Pallet 13, when the fish are specifically tight to the bottom. So we're looking at thermoclines. This is usually indicative of a blue haze across the horizon. This return is usually of denser water, is usually at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is transition layer between warmer and cooler layers of water. This transition shows denser water, which has layers of debris, plankton, and nutrients in this layer. Intersecting this layer with structure is a good strategy when fishing, depending on your species. So to see this thermocline, your filtering has to be off and your sensitivity high enough so you can see that faint haze on your thermocline. Another type of haze you might expect to see, if you're in brackish water, you may see the different salinity levels in the graph, also called a halocline. Uh, debris particles or different water clarity of water may show up as a cloud too in the sonar reading. So water coming in off a drainage pipe or off a river will have a haze type look on it as well, as well as water being pushed through neck down areas. So on this screenshot, we're looking at our down rigging setup. We've moved our down rigging balls up and down to show you what they look like on your sonar. So notice how these 10 pound balls have a harder return as they get closer to the sonar. The fish we're seeing here are lake trout 
are spread out across the bottom 25 feet of a lake. If you can't see your balls on your unit, a wider cone angle may be needed as a blowback from the downrigging line may be too great. Some anglers will actually point back their puck to aim it at the balls and to sometimes pick up following fish. Just be sure to return it to the proper angle afterwards. We also see an area of slightly harder bottom on this sonar screenshot as well. So as for ice fishing with your units, uh, this can actually help you understand in real time for open water. You have less outside interference factors in play when you're using this for ice fishing. A minnow can look any size depending on your settings. You can use your jig as a frame of reference to adjust your settings and as you change spots as well. So most ice fishermen understand this. Also another great thing about uh, a lot of ice anglers understand is that you can't see your jig if it's on the bottom. Ice anglers understand that you must lift it off the bottom to see it. Your sonar can't really pick fish out that are on the bottom. Changing your bottom color can help, but doesn't guarantee this. There's also mud, debris, rocks, and silt layers that help disguise fish right on the bottom. Sometimes this layer can be up to a foot thick. That can easily disguise a fish. So I got Bassmaster Open Tournament, which actually was just won in Tennessee by Cooper Gallant, because the bass were on the bottom at 20 feet. With the four facing sonars, down imaging, side imaging, and sonar, they wouldn't show them on the bottom. Cooper actually had to hover the baits one to two feet above the bottom to get the fish to rise to become intrigued to hit it. Nothing showed it. Goes to show these fish can be hidden along the bottom and you'll never know it. So sitting still, going slow, or an anchor lock, like zero mile per hour. The fish sit under the cone angle longer. They look elongated and as long continuous streaks as they absorb more pings under the cone angle. This can also make the fish look bigger. So zigzags are your jig movements up and down. Fish moves up, looks at the bait. It would be harder to see interpret this information without the histograph on your left. Yellow and thick, and then the line moves down and thinning out, can be fish at the edge of the cone or moving away. So zigzag arches up and down are good news. Fish are active, looking for bait, responding to the bait. So reading on plane. With the boat moving fast over each fish, they're only under the cone angle for a short amount of time and they don't get pinged as often. Fish usually show up as a condensed arch on a higher speed or as a check mark. As your speed comes down, the fish arch starts to widen and become taller on the readout as it receives more pings. So it's turning the sensitivity up. It looks ugly and has a bit of noise. It's a bit muddy. Easier to see fish with the increased sensitivity and then using a dark blue or black background for fish to really stand out. It's going to hide some of the noise when you turn up the sensitivity and then the yellow really stands out. It's easier to use and see fish on plane this way. When you turn it down, it clean up the screen, it takes a stronger return for anything to show up, especially when you're moving that fast. So you miss fish if the sensitivity is not up. Even the big ones on the outside of the cone angle, because the signal's only strong in the middle when it's turned down. Turn it up and you can see the fish closer to the bottom and at the edge of the cone angle, and the separation is better. Running at 25 miles per hour when on plane is going to give you the best picture quality and you're not going to miss too much with the interference and the angles as you turn. Another trick while riding on plane is to turn up your scroll speed, even up to the fastest setting sometimes. It'll help elongate these arches. You won't get the traditional arches, but it'll help widen them with better target separation and interpretation. You'll help eliminate a lot of the dead water this way and be more productive. So you'll be heading out to your spot and sometimes you won't even make it to the spot you're heading to because you've marked fish along the way. So this next screen here, it's all about marking a fish waypoint and then you can drive to the fish afterwards after you set that waypoint. It's easier to do with a 0.1 antenna or similar for Garmin and Hummingbird. So doing this after you've trolled over the fish allows you to stay out from it and cast to it or realign to your boat to that same mark and downrank back over it. Where is this fish after it leaves this day scope? So when we grab the screen, we scroll back into our history, we mark with the waypoint right on top of the fish. We hit waypoint with our waypoint button. When the cursor is over top of the thickest part of the middle of the return, we do this so when we get the most accurate waypoint that gives up the best coordinates and depth data for the waypoint, it's important to zoom in two or three times right on top of the fish to get the most accurate detail and on the top little thin black line on top of the fish as well. Something to keep in mind when you're looking for fish is that returns can get lost in the cone angle, especially when fish hang out near the bottom or near depth changes. The fish can get lost in the cone angle as a wider cone will average out the depth of return throughout the spread. So a narrow cone angle will help with that for better definition. 
just something to keep in mind when you're looking for fish near the bottom. With different makes and models of fish finder units, some can actually run two frequencies at the same time. So we're set up here, we have two frequencies set up at once with low range transducers. You need to create two 2D custom menus from the pages menu, and then select two different transducer frequencies like 283. Though it gives you half the ping speed on several units, it enables you to view two different frequencies at the same time. And the split screen is good for this, uh, especially when searching on the back of the boat, looking around on different structures. And so it helps you widen your swath, but it also helps say if you have friends up front, they're jigging underneath the trolling water transducer and you're at the back of the boat jigging. This helps you to look at their jig and see what's coming and then to look at your jig and to monitor both the fish and the jigging cadences as well and see what's turning on fish and what's turning them off. So another thing, when we talk about sonar interpretation, another tool you have at hand that helps you differentiate different varieties of sonar returns, for example, rocks, bottom, trees, fish, uh, bridge pilings, etc., simply is just do a side-by-side -side comparison with your down imaging. Your down imaging is going to give you more picture-like quality and it will help differentiate between the two and know exactly what you're looking at. So when in doubt, turn on that down imaging and compare it side-by-side -side with your sonar. That's it for the video today. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it. If you like our videos, please like and subscribe. Have a great day guys, tight lines.